The St. Louis Cardinals won a baseball game on Sunday, which is great. But what's going on with this Contreras to the outfield thing? I got the latest on this bizarre decision on today's episode of Locked on Cardinals. You are Locked on Cardinals, your daily St. Louis Cardinals podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Cardinals fans. I'm J.D. Haffern, and I'm a national radio sports anchor, born and raised in the Lou and a lifetime Cardinals fan, and I'm your host for Locked On Cardinals, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You can follow me on Twitter at J.D. Sports Radio and the podcast at LO underscore Cardinals. I want to thank those of you who make Locked On Cardinals your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, and we're on YouTube. Make sure you like, subscribe, and comment. That way you can interact with us. Hit the notification button so you don't miss out on new episodes when they get posted. This is a show serving Cardinal Nation and giving the best fans in baseball all of the info about the birds on the bat. So anything anything going on over the weekend with the Cardinals? I think we, uh, I think we could come up with a few things to talk about today. First off, the St. Louis Cardinals finally won a baseball game. All right. They get a win on Sunday. Thanks to three home runs by the reigning NL MVP, Paul Goldschmidt. Had a, a heck of a day. Solid start from Steven Matz. Good for him. And you got key hits from guys like Brendan Donovan, Lars Newt Barr, who had a big series, and Andrew Kisner. So props to all of them for uh, getting the victory on Sunday. Instead of crumbling after that grand slam was hit uh, against JoJo Romero, the team showed fight. Uh, they battled back and finally got a win after eight straight losses and they avoid the sweep by the Tigers. That's great. A sigh of relief to get the win, right? But don't think for a minute <laughs> that yesterday's victory overshadows one of the most bizarre turn of events so far this season. And that was the story that came out on Friday, right? That the St. Louis Cardinals, the St. Louis Cardinals were removing prize free agent acquisition Wilson Contreras from his catching duties and were instead going to use him primarily as a designated hitter and in the outfield. My first reaction, which I think a lot of people felt when it first came out, was there was a mistake written there, that it wasn't an outfield, that it was a typo. I checked the calendar. Can't be an April Fool's joke. April Fool's Day was a long time ago. Is this real? People were wondering if the, the 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 Twitter posts that were being put out there were from fake accounts. That's how crazy this idea was. And you're going to tell me that a St. Louis Cardinals franchise that has built their organization around stability. Smart decision making for the most part. We all know they make mistakes. Usually calculated strategic moves to the roster. They don't just do things on a whim have already hit the abort button on a catcher that they signed to the largest free agent contract in team history after a mere 30 games into his five-year $87.5 million deal. That's what you're telling me. If I had said that to you earlier in this year, you'd have called me crazy. An absolute psycho, right? But this is the reality of what's going on with this team right now. Nothing seems to make sense. So the plan now is to make him a DH and use him in the outfield at the age of 31. W what? An outfield, by the way, where you already had too many guys already. So much that you had to send down your top prospect, Jordan Walker, because he wasn't going to get enough at bats playing there. You also sent him down because you wanted him to work on his defense, which wasn't very good. But we knew that was going to be that way, considering he's only played the position for one year of his life. You want him to work on, uh, you know, his uh, his angles, you know, hitting the ball in the air more. He wanted to work on that as well. Okay. But you're going to stick Wilson Contreras out there in the outfield with his defensive deficiencies? <laughs> you're just going to stick a catcher out there instead? 
the same outfield and the same lineup that Dylan Carlson could hardly crack in the first month of the season. And and what are you going to do when O'Neill comes back? What what happens there? I want to take a look at the ripple effect that a decision like this would make on the everyday lineup. Okay, so come with me on this journey. Let's start with Andrew Kisner, who who will now be doing the bulk of the catching. Familiarity with the staff is one of the reasons why he's getting this opportunity. It's why they want him back there. And that's fine. But the reason you got Contreras was to upgrade the catching position offensively, right? I mean, that was the idea. That was the whole point of it. You knew about his shortcomings as a catcher. They were widely documented uh, all offseason. <laughs> I mean, I've never talked about pitch framing so much in my life than this past offseason. But Contreras, we knew, had a great arm. He had a great bat. Not a great catcher. We we knew that. You signed off on that, that that was okay. It wasn't breaking news. Andrew Kisner, I don't know how great you think he is defensively. I guess he's okay. I, I haven't seen enough of him to really know if he's that great. But he's a terrible offensive catcher. At least he has been since coming to the big leagues. Now, we're back to square one where the offense at this position is going to be subpar. That's what you were fixing with Wilson Contreras as your free agent acquisition. Now, granted, Kiz, last couple of days, had some big hits recently. That's fantastic. I hope he keeps it up. I really do. I, I know it makes it sound like I'm rooting against him. I'm really not. But the body of work that we've seen over the last few seasons from him as a hitter have not been good. He's normally not a very good hitter at the major league level. He wasn't so bad at the minors, but at the major league level, he hasn't had a, a lot of success. Maybe he'll prove me wrong. And I hope he does because they're going to need him to hit. He's going to have to do things like he did on Sunday. So now we look. So you got Kisner back there, subpar hitter, as far as we know. Now let's look at what you're doing with Contreras. Okay. If the idea is to make him DH more, because the outfield thing, it's brought up, but it's not like he's going to be starting out there all the time. DHing is really where the main focus of this was going to be, right? So what happens to Nolan Gorman? Remember him? One of your top young talents that has had a fantastic year. Has been used almost entirely as your DH. The guy that leads your team in home runs and RBIs. That guy. Yeah, yeah. Nolan Gorman. You're not going to bench him, right? No? Okay. So what's he going to do? He's going to go play second base? Not going to play third. Nolan Arnato's over there at third. You're not going to do that. So what are you going to do? Second base? Second base. Okay. Well, doesn't that drastically hurt you defensively, though, if you do that? You have a gold glover at each spot in the infield right now. Third base, shortstop, second, first. All four of them have one gold gloves. Defense is important in St. Louis, isn't it? Always has been. But because of this Contreras move, you're going to sacrifice that defense now as well. So what does that mean for Brendan Donovan? What are we going to do with him? Remember him? Your opening day second baseman just won that utility gold glove last year. Are you kind of eliminating him from the lineup now altogether? What are you going to do with him? I mean, he was your opening day leadoff hitter when everybody was healthy. Are we, are we done with that? You believed in him enough to give him the job at second base last year and move your former gold glove winner at second base, Tommy Edmond, over to shortstop in place of Paul DeYoung, who was in a two- to three-year slump at the plate. So we're, we're not, what? What are we doing with Donovan now? So what we've created here is a log jam in the middle infield and in the outfield now with this move. Man. Sucks, right? If only someone had told you to trade some of these extra pieces off this offseason to, I don't know, get some starting pitching or something like that. If only somebody had suggested that. Who could have seen this coming, right? Now, the updated story on this is that Contreras will not. He will not be playing the outfield. According to Katie Wu, who kind of teamed up with Ken Rosenthal's story at The Athletic, President of Baseball Operations, John Mozalock said, 
We won't have him in the outfield. I know that came out yesterday, but after talking with him, it's basically going to be more in the DH role right now. And there's light at the end of the tunnel to get back behind the plate. I don't anticipate Contreras in the outfield unless there's some sort of emergency reason. Everything was moving quickly yesterday. A lot of things were getting out there. His hope is he gets a chance to get behind the plate. That's what we're going to work toward. Manager Ali Marmel on this says, there are ways to make sure that Contreras' bat is in the lineup while we execute our plan internally. How long is that going to take? That I don't have an answer for. But there's a plan that we feel good about to make sure we get him to where he's comfortable and our pitchers are comfortable in executing. According to the story, which I'll link in the description below on our, our YouTube page, Contreras actually approached the Cardinals on Saturday after the club lost to Detroit again. He understood that his role for now will be as the team's primary designated hitter. However, he expressed a desire to remain focused on two positions, catcher and DH. The Cardinals adjusted and will no longer keep him in the tentative outfield plans. So what was the problem with Contreras behind the plate? Now, I've never gotten a certain answer on that. There hasn't been like something they just said, well, he's doing this wrong. We haven't heard that. Now, Ali said this to Lynn Worthy at stltoday.com in his story. The way I would describe is truly understanding our system of executing the game plan with each individual pitcher. The reality is it's more than he's ever had to do. Nothing against the way he has done it. It's just it's very different, and it's a lot of work. Back to Mosaic talking about this. The nuances of that position may be very subtle. Are what a lot of pitcher are, are what a lot of our pitchers were used to. What we're seeing was a lack of confidence. Normally, you would say, "Why didn't you address this in spring training?" But in spring training, it's so different in terms of what people are trying to work on. Pitchers are going a couple of innings. It doesn't really count. Wait, what? It doesn't count. What the hell are they doing in spring training? Is Contreras just going behind the plate and just going, serve it up? Yeah, just whatever. I'll just, I'll catch it. Just whatever. We'll figure it out. What are you talking about? What do you mean it doesn't count? Wilson Contreras purposely did not go to the World Baseball Classic. Didn't play for his country. Because he wanted to stay with the team and learn and work with his new teammates and pitchers to get a grasp on all of this. That was the whole point why he didn't go and play for Venezuela. He skipped out on that so that he could come to spring training, be there the whole time with all of these pitchers. More from Mo here. When you ask where is this on the pitcher side, the difference is this year you have a pitch clock in the past if Hypothetically, you were my catcher and you keep asking me to throw a slider. I could just step off. Eventually, if you wanted to burn one of your mound visits, we could talk it over. But the clock has changed the dynamic of the interaction. It does speed things up. We need to come up with a strategy of how the communication between our catcher and pitchers can become more seamless or candidly more timely to allow if they're not on the same page. Wait, what? Did, did the pitch clock get implemented like in week two of the regular season and these guys had no idea how to prepare for this? Did their entire minor league system not go through all of this last year? How unprepared were you coming into this regular season? Now the pitchers don't have enough time to shake off the catch. I, every other major league team seems to be doing fine with it excuses over and over. Mo continues, what I don't want to have happen is a finger point. This is all Wilson's fault because it's not. There are many parts of our team right now that are not performing to what we expected. But that's what you're doing with all of these changes. You don't pull a guy out of the catcher position if you're not putting blame on him. That's all this looks like. How are we not supposed to look at this whole situation like you're blaming Wilson Contreras? You didn't pull Steven Matz from his starts because he sucked. Looked good yesterday, but you didn't pull him. Some of these guys who have been hit. Tyler O'Neill was still going out there and playing a lot. 
You didn't let Dylan Carlson play for almost the first month. The excuses just keep coming. Mo continued, I do think the nuances of the catching side, we haven't had to spend a whole lot of energy thinking about it because of what Yachty did for us. You know what's that you know that saying, you sometimes feel like you had a coach on the field. That was Yachty. That's how we thought. Even though you might have a game plan, Yachty had the ability to allow that to evolve during a game, real-time decision-making. But again, they're not pointing fingers. It's not Wilson's fault. But, you know, you bring up Yachty's name and not having him now has made life a little more difficult for you and that Contreras isn't Yachty. Well, no kidding. Who thought he was supposed to be? And you know what? When it when it comes to having uh, you know, like a, another coach out there, you have a pitching coach. He's right there in the dugout. You telling me they can't talk about this stuff and figure it out? What the hell does Dusty Blake do then? Like, what is his job? What is his purpose? If he's not coaching what's going on between the catcher and the pitcher, what the hell's he doing? Do they just throw these guys out there and go, eh, you know, do whatever? And then when it doesn't work out, they're like, oh, well, you should have done this. Why are you telling him to do these things? Maybe they are. Maybe they are. And Contreras is just like, screw you guys. I'm not, I'm not listening. But I doubt it. <laughs> I sincerely doubt it. The bottom line, in my opinion, is you overestimated how good your pitchers were. You thought they were going to be better, and they weren't, even though we all warned you. Everybody in the league saw that your starting pitching was not going to be that good. But yet you stuck with them. You didn't invest in them. You invested in a catcher for his offense. And now you're taking him away from catching duties because he's not as good of a catcher as Yadier Molina. Nobody is, you guys. Nobody. And I'll tell you this, Wilson Contreras is not the one hanging breaking balls, missing up and over the plate constantly walking guys, not holding runners on. He's not doing that. And if it's the pitch calling, if that's the problem, if Wilson Contreras is the only guy who can call a pitch in your dugout and the pitcher has no chance to override it, then you guys are idiots. You're doing something. I have seen managers and pitching coaches call the game from the dugout. They put up a little, boom, 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 they do the signs, catch a relays it to the pitcher, bang. They've been doing it at all sorts of levels of baseball for years. And your pitcher can shake anything off. He can do that. He kind of has the last word. I, I'm flabbergasted. <clears throat> I'm flabbergasted by this. The decision-making from this front office to this coaching staff has been so odd this year. It's so confusing. I don't even recognize this team in this franchise right now. I have no idea who they are. These are not St. Louis Cardinals' ideas and moves. These, these are moves and excuses from a, a team that looks so unprepared and has no idea what they're doing from top to bottom. That's what it looks like to me. And it's crazy to think that that's what this is. This has come to. I want to get into some of the other odd decisions they've decided to make this year. We're going to do that next. Plus, we'll talk about the upcoming series with the Cubs right here on Locked on Cardinals. I'm sorry that segment was so long, but my gosh. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, do the smart thing. Head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right. The first time around, just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check mark to know that the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right, part, right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusion supply.
The Cardinals are in Chicago for their series with the Cubs, and you can catch every pitch of the Cardinals hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Cardinals. My everydayers, thank you for being a part of this. Um, you've heard me question some of the moves this organization has made over the first month of the season and the dysfunction that continues to occur. It's unlike anything I've ever seen with the Cardinals. Remember when doing things the Cardinal way, that was something you could you could hang your hat on and you could stand by it as a Cardinals fan, right? For the most part, they would have sound decision making by the front office, uh, consistent, fundamentally sound play on the field. You could always bank on that, right? Very little controversy, very little. Every team has it from time to time, but very little. And more importantly, they win baseball games. They win baseball games doing it their way. It has been the complete opposite in 2023. Let's start with Jordan Walker. Keeping Jordan Walker on the roster out of spring training. I didn't like it. I was happy for the kid, but I didn't necessarily like it because guess what? You already had a ton of outfielders. But you said you wouldn't keep him on there unless he was going to play. Again, four capable outfielders already on your roster had earned spots on this team, played on this team last year. So they play him out of the out of every day out of the gate. Lars Newbar gets hurt, makes it a little easier to play him every day. He goes on that hitting streak, but as soon as the streak is over and they they start sitting him. Eventually sit him down to work on his his hitting mechanics, his launch angles. Why the hell did you keep him on the roster in the first place then? At the end of spring training, Jordan Walker wasn't hitting anything. He was getting no hits. Remember, he couldn't hit a left-hander to save his life. Kept him on the roster anyway. Stupid, stupid move. You had the competition for the uh, center field job. Remember that? Remember that thing was going on? O'Neill appeared to have won the job out of nowhere. We decided that, hey, we're going to move everybody around and somebody, everybody gets to compete for the center field job. It'll be fun. O'Neill appeared to have won the job, goes and plays for Team Canada, looks good at the WBC, but then is back in left field in a couple of weeks. Then you have the ripping of O'Neill for not scoring against Atlanta, which was a mess. Some still think that might have caused a, a riff in the clubhouse that still hasn't fully healed. Then you decide it was Zach Thompson, who's been one of your best relief pitchers. He was last year, was excellent, outstanding in the spring. And through his first eight appearances this year, spring and the first eight appearances, didn't give up a run. Has a rough patch. Three straight games, kind of rough. Maybe he's a little exhausted since you had to pitch him almost every game. Ever thought of that? So they ship him to Memphis and tell him, yeah, you're done being a relief pitcher. We're going to stretch you out. You're going to be a starter. We'll see you next year, probably. What? Are you, what? This yo-yo thing that you're doing with a former first round pick in Zach Thompson is ridiculous. He wasn't even a good starter in the minor leagues. It looked like he found his niche as a relief pitcher. That's great. That's a positive. But after a couple of shaky appearances, it's over. You're just boop. You're done. Maybe you'll make the team as a starter next year. Taylor Motter. Getting DFA'd, brought back, doesn't hardly play, gets DFA'd again. That's weird. The bad fundamentals on this team are baffling. The attention to small deals seem to continuously slip through the cracks. The other day, Brendan Donovan, who I love, I think he's great, basically runs into right field to catch a fly ball. When on the replay, Lars Newbar is right there, calling him off the ball, saying, I got it, I got it. But Donovan keeps coming, catches it anyway with his momentum going away from the infield with a runner on third who just tags up and scores easily because Donovan can't stop his momentum, turn around and throw him out. If Newt gets that ball, there's at the very least a play at the plate, especially with his great arm, or the runner doesn't even attempt to score at all. What is Donovan doing there? Pitcher execution has been horrendous. The home runs and batting average with two strikes is bonkers to me. Last year, the Cardinals gave up 51 two-strike home runs. They're at 21 already this year. Last year, teams hit 179 against them with two strikes. This year, they're up to 216. And it's not just pitch selection. Don't give me that. 
it's missing spots routinely. That's been the, the main culprit of these problems for me. Twice last week, Otley pulls Montgomery in yesterday. Mats, when their pitch counts seemed fine. They were throwing wonderful games. They were cruising almost. Then he goes to the bullpen, and both times the bullpen coughs up the lead. Friday, Monty's yanked after 89 pitches, and it was Hicks, who has been much better recently, so I, and part of me understands why you would go to him. But blows the lead, and then on Sunday, James Nail and JoJo Romero have to come in. And they give up five runs in two-thirds of an inning after pulling Mats after 84 pitches when he finally looked good. I don't get it. The dysfunction. It's unheard of. I, I've never seen anything like this with the Cardinals. And it's why they're 11-24, and 24, nine games out of first place in the division. They did get a win yesterday. They have a chance to uh, make up for it like some ground here because they're going to be playing the uh, Cubs for the next couple of days. We're going to talk about that series next on Locked on Cardinals. The Cardinals will be sending Miles Michaelis to the mound tonight. You can catch every pitch of the Cardinals hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app. Search Cardinals. Cubs are 17 and 17 on the year. Third place in the division, two and a half back of Pittsburgh, who have now lost seven in a row. They've come crashing down to earth. They've also played some uh, better competition in the last week. Um, the Cubs are just three and seven in their last 10, so it's not like they're playing great lately. Um, they're kind of what we thought they were supposed to be this year. They're they're at 500. Nobody thought they'd suck. Nobody thought they'd be great. They're just kind of you know, right in the middle there. Uh, former Cardinal first-round pick Patrick Wisdom, just another guy that's gone off onto other teams and had success, is leading their team in home runs and RBIs with 11 and 21, respectively. They made the big free agent signing of Dansby Swanson at shortstop and Cody Bellinger this offseason. Swanson has struggled a little bit, 271, two home runs, nine RBIs. Bellinger having a resurgent season at the plate, hitting 300 with seven home runs and 19 RBIs. He looks dangerous again. Ian Happ is still there. Very familiar with him. Trey Mancini, they brought him in. Eric Hosmer, they brought in. I mean, they brought in a lot of free agents. He, he, not the most recognizable Cubs team anymore. Um, but all those guys have been kind of meh. But the guy to keep an eye on, at least for me, who I think is, is a main cog to what's going on in Chicago this year, is their leadoff hitter, Nico Horner. Hitting 309, 12 stolen bases, 19 RBIs out of that leadoff spot. He is a pain in the butt. <laughs> you do not like to play Nico Horner. You love Nico Horner on your team. You hate playing against him because he creates chaos. So he's a guy you got to you gotta slow him down in this series. Uh, the club as a whole, fifth in the league in batting average, fifth in OBP, ninth in slugging, seventh in OPS. They can hit. And we figured they would this year. Where we didn't think they'd be that good, where we thought the Cubs might be vulnerable this year, was their starting pitching, really. And that has not been the case. They've actually been very, very good. Third in team ERA for starters at 3.19, just fractions behind second place. They don't give up a lot of home runs, just 18 on the year. They don't strike out a ton of people either, but they don't walk people. So they're not their own enemy putting runners on. Um, Justin Steele has been incredible for them. He's been their ace, 5-0, 1.45 ERA. Got him on my so rare uh, fantasy team, by the way. He's been great. Uh, the Cardinals will see him on a Wednesday. Tonight's starter, Marcus Stroman, very familiar with him, obviously. He's been around a number of years. 2-2, two 2.18 two, 2 ERA. Leads the team in walks, but also leads the team in strikeouts. So um, he is what he is. We, we, we've seen Stroman a lot. And then on Tuesday, it's um, Jamison Tyon. Remember, they got him from the Yankees. He's had a tough go, but a disappointment for Chicago. Just 0-2, ERA over 5. So that's what we're getting into over the next couple of days in Chicago. I want to thank you guys for making Locked on Cardinals your first listen every day. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to recap what happens tonight whatever bizarre ideas the Cardinals come up with. Maybe Goldie will be at shortstop, new bar over. At I don't know what they're going to come up with next. This season is drunk. It is drunk and it needs to go to bed. Be sure to catch every pitch of the Cardinals hometown broadcast for this series against the Cubs at historic Wrigley Field with Sirius XM on the SXM app. Just search Cardinals. If you haven't already, give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Cardinals and at JD Sports Radio. Like, subscribe on YouTube. You're a very patient fan base. Because that's the word Mo likes to say a lot. So we must be considering all of the crap that's going on right now. I believe you're the best fans in baseball for a reason. And I'll see you next time 
on Locked on Cardinals. I'm going to go cool off. 